OK, so who have they got? Ben Brereton-Diaz, scorer of 32 goals in 61 appearances. Who have we got? Ashley Barnes, scorer of 2 goals in 18 months. That doesn't sound like much. It's all we're going to need. <laughs> Hi, my name's Mike. Welcome to this week's vlog, which obviously is going to start off talking about the fantastic 3-0 win over that lot from down the road in the East Lancashire Derby. Perhaps the perfect day, the perfect game, the perfect result. Um, it didn't go off with any trouble, despite people like myself worrying about it. And I think a large part of that was down to the performance and the result. The Claros were absolutely superb. And for me... The fact that Ashley Barnes has been absolutely useless for the past part of 18 months and then decides to be completely unplayable for 90 minutes is peak Ashley Barnes. The shithouse is shithouse, basically. As the song will undoubtedly be changed to be Who Put the Keeper in the Bastard's Net? That will be Ashley Barnes. He was absolutely magnificent, but the rest of the team around him were absolutely magnificent as well. Anna Sorori, fantastic. Josh Cullen, Jack Cork, Josh Brownhill, every single one of them was absolutely superb. And it's kind of interesting sort of seeing the feedback and the comments by everybody else, especially when you check that bot down the road, where they're sort of complaining that they didn't have any local players who knew the significance of what the game meant. Well, neither did we. But if you watch Nathan Teller at the end write himself into Burnley legend by giving that gesture at the Rovers defender, these guys didn't need to be born locally to know what this meant. They, they could feel it in the club, they could feel it from the fans, they could feel it from everybody involved that this actually is the game of the season. One out of 46 according to the league table, but this one matters forever. When Clarets finally broke that that streak of not beating them for 35 years. I said at the time that promotion would have been fantastic, but it would never have been as good as it was without actually finally getting one over them. And you can never really be sure either, because the football gods have always been on their side. But they weren't on Sunday. The Clarets were magnificent from start to finish. I think for the first 45 minutes, it was a derby game where they're feeling each other out. First half, it was a case of Rovers, show us what you got. Second half, oh, absolutely sod all then. So we'll take over from here. Ashley Barnes being peak Ashley Barnes, as I mentioned. If you actually look at it closely, and I'm not being harsh, I'm not being critical. I'm just saying this is just Ashley Barnes all over. He mistimes his header for the opening goal and leaves the, complete, uh, the, the keeper completely stranded. For his second goal, he chops the defender with a magnificent piece of skill and then miss kicks it, but then it's deflected in anyway. And that, for the second goal, the one scored by Anna Saduri, a beautiful over-the-shoulder dropping volley, which is an incredibly sublime piece of skill. It's really, really difficult to do that. He connects brilliantly, and it's typical Ashley Barnes that that's the one the keeper saves. But, you know, that's the way the guy plays. Uh, I've said to myself that you know he's kind of been kept around a little bit for dressing room vibes and not much else he does have a habit of playing one or two games where he's completely unstoppable and the rest being completely useless and thank god it was that day thank god he decided or, or whatever it was the, the one day where he turns into Ronaldo and I mean not the one who's currently whinging his way out of Manchester United but Brazilian Ronaldo rampaging through the opposition defence in a completely unstoppable way happened to be Sunday and wow I'm just so glad that it did so a day to absolutely remember and a game to remember that will live long I mean I've watched the highlights so many times already and I'll continue watching them from now until the end of the season but normally I don't talk about games uh, in general but it kind of triggers something that I was, I've been talking about or thinking about talking about anyway as I'm recording this it's the 15th of November which is seven months to the day that Sean Dyche was sacked as Burnley manager and I want you to think about the difference between Burnley FC as it was under Sean Dyche on the day he was sacked and Burnley FC as it is now. And I don't just mean on the pitch and I don't mean personnel, I also mean off the pitch in the way that the club is marketed, in the way the club does social media, 
in the way that the club's attitude towards fans has changed and been more open. The, the club itself is completely unrecognisable from just seven months ago in just about every single facet of on and off the pitch. And we can give the players an incredible amount of credit for how they've come in, been not thrown together, but 16 new signings, a brand new division, for many of them a brand new country, in a place that is particularly unfashionable, been kind of put together. Then Vincent Company comes in, doesn't, I know people say, oh, he, you know, he doesn't know the championship and all that kind of thing. And I always think that kind of thing's overrated. But, you know, he's, he's a comparatively inexperienced manager. He's certainly never managed in somewhere like the championship, which is ferociously competitive at the best of times. He's been given 16 brand new players and he's melded them into a team that I think has exceeded all expectations. I said to myself at the start, and I said to anyone who would listen, at the start of the season, if we got to the World Cup break around the playoff playoff places, I would be a very happy money, especially given the upheaval. To be clear at the top, um, I don't want to say things like miracle or unexpected or anything like that because it's completely deserved. Their, their players have been fantastic. The job they have done has been amazing. But I think the most relieved guy at Turf Moor, and you could see it towards the end of the match, is Alan Pace. Uh, ALK, it's not just Alan Pace, uh, it's ALK in general. Alan Pace is not, he might be the chairman of the club, but he's not the guy who owns the club. He doesn't have the money, you know, he's not the one putting the money in. He is the, the front guy for a bunch of investors who are expecting a return. And he has taken several gambles over the past seven months, not least sacking Sean Dyche not least bringing in Vincent Company and basically I think if they could have brought in an entirely new team uh, and not really held on to some of the players I think they might have tried to do it but he was taking a massive gamble or he's the focal point for a massive gamble taken by a bunch of owners and that gamble appears to have paid off I think it came here with a plan and I think that plan was not what traditional football or traditional football people were expecting. They had a very clear vision for what they were going to do. And I know that over the summer and in the early part of the season, there were things appearing on social media where they were talking about the number of people who'd been let go. We're talking, you know, physios, we're talking bathroom, backroom staff, we're talking media people and all that kind of stuff. And I think with the, the benefit of hindsight, it's clear that ALK had a plan and you're either on board with it or there is the door. It's a particularly ruthless way of doing business, but it's a successful way of doing business. And I think the changes that the club have made are clear to see. Now, that doesn't mean that the way the takeover is financed has gone away. But I think it's taken the focus off that. If you remember, you know, so many people were saying, well, Burnley might drop through, they might go into administration and so on and so forth. The fact that we've sold so many players, £70 million worth of players, has kind of got under the radar because of the success. Um, and I think that's kind of, you know, it wasn't exactly the plan. I think it was kind of the hope. Um, but, you know, as Arnold Palmer used to say, you know, the, the more I try, the luckier I get. And I think that these people, especially ALK, deserve credit for coming in with a plan that has... I would bet, exceeded their wildest expectations. I think it's certainly exceeded the club and the fans' wildest expectations. And, you know, it's gone better than they have. But we mustn't forget, you know, the, the financial invol involvement. The fact that they have actually, you know, they basically paid for this, this championship season by making a 30-odd million pound profit on the players that they've sold. Fair play to them. No one saw it was going to be as good as it was, and all credit to them. And I think that there are a number of people who uh, not owe them an apology. That's not the right word, but I think there are a few people who, who basically just need to maybe wind their necks in a little bit with the approach that, you know, the, the sort of the outsiders coming into a, a club, you know, they're American, they don't understand how football works, etc. and so forth. 
But I'll always caution, you know, I've never, you know, never get too high, never get too low. What I will say is, you know, I hopefully they don't they think that they've cracked football because this game has a way of kicking you when you're up. It has a way of bringing you down to earth very, very quickly. I mean, I look at this team, I think this team is massively flawed in a wonderfully entertaining way, which basically means anything that you want to project onto this team, you can in any way, shape, or form. If you want to turn around and say they're brilliantly entertaining going forward, you can. If you want to say they're dodgy at the back, you can. You can point to players who perhaps you think should be better or you don't like the style or you can't get used to, you know, I think uh, Arya Murich, I think he's a, a good keeper um, who gives me a heart attack, but I love the fact that he, he's willing to, or, or part of a, a system that tries to score every time even he has the ball. You know, I love Nathan Teller, but, you know, you're not supposed to fall in love with a, um, a lone play, player, but, you know, he gets it, you know, that, that, as I say, that, that uh, photograph of him giving the signal is going to go down in Burnley folklore. Um, but most of all, I think Anna Zorori is just an absolute find. Um, I love the fact that... And go back and watch the highlights of the first goal from Sunday. And try to ignore the commentary. But when he picks the ball up, you see 20,000 people lean forward and you hear them hold their breath. And he is that kind of player. Having sat on the turf, every time he gets the ball with a little bit of space to run at his winger, everyone leans forward and has a look. And I think that is a fantastic testament to a player who is going to go on to bigger and better things at another club. And he's going to go on to those bigger and better things with the full support of every Burnley fan who just loves watching him play. For me... It's similar to uh, 2014 when Leicester in January bought Riyad Mahrez. You saw Mahrez on that wing and you just went, that guy is far too good for this championship. He's far too good for Leicester. He is going to go on to bigger and better things. And he has. And I think Anna Sarouri is, is Riyad Mahrez. Um, and it's a privilege to watch him play. Um, it's great to watch Nathan Teller play. It's great to watch Taylor Harwood Bellis um, Play alongside, you know, John Bayer. I mean, these are two players who are barely old enough to be drinking, um, but they are a wonderful centre back partnership. So, what can I say? It's it's a fantastic time to be a Burnley fan. I never thought that this was where we were going to be six months ago, but it's a hell of a ride. Um, and we go into a World Cup break with top of the league, looking down on everybody else. Not least of all them down the road. And I think I think what was really good about Sunday was it was a lesson. It was a lesson to them in a in a big way that actually no, this is what a good team looks like. This is what a properly running football club looks like. And Burnley have not been in a situation over them for thirty years. If that, you know, if, if 30, 40 years, we've never been able to look down on them and go, no, we are, we are the better club. Even under the Deitch years, um, 2014, you know, when we were struggling to, to break that hoodoo, it never felt like we were the better ones. It always felt like it was going to be close. It always felt like luck was going to kick us when we needed it not to, and it did with the offside, that offside equaliser with Duffo's clearance. It just never felt like it was going to happen. It always felt like we were the underdog, and now we're the top. We're the pride of East Lancashire. And what more can you ask for than that? As a Claret, it's a beautiful feeling. So that's it for this week. You know, nothing particularly in the way of thoughtfulness or anything like that. But what I thought was, you know, I'll put my feelings down about the Derby game. Um, you know, remind people that this club has changed so much in seven months and uh, it's an exciting time uh, but it's always perspective you know, seven months is a hell of a short time to make the change that has been made 
and it is a credit to everybody involved on and off the pitch uh, that it has been such a success so far. It feels like I'm tempting fate with a World Cup break, but you know, at the end of the day, I'm going to go into the World Cup break, and I'll say this, and it may it might be tempting fate, whatever. I genuinely believe that we have the most talented team in the championship. It doesn't necessarily mean we're the best. Um, it means we have the most talented and exciting team. And it's an unusual situation to go from the team that everybody hated for reasons that were false. You know, We weren't a bunch of thugs. We weren't anti-football. We were doing what we needed to do to survive to actually being a team that everybody wants to watch and everybody wants to see uh, and get excited by watching. And that is an incredible thing. So that's it for this week. I'm not sure what I'll be doing the next one. I might do something sort of World Cup based, but I'm not intending to because the World Cup uh, is not something I'm particularly passionate about because of where it is, um, how it was bought. Uh, what's got into you know the 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 what what's got into actually making the stadiums you know building the stadiums and putting it on. Obviously, if England do well, then you kind of get swept up in it. And I will watch a few games. I'm not holding them now. If you want to enjoy it, enjoy it. But uh, there'll always be that asterisk against it for me. But uh, I might well do something during the World Cup. If not, then it'll be uh, a resumption of the Championship. If you have any feedback, please. Leave it below. Uh, you can always sort of contact me, you know, on, on YouTube. Leave a message. You know, so you'll see me around on social media. And in the meantime, enjoy the World Cup break. And uh, if you're going to be like me, I'd print out the league table and stick it above the desk and just look at it every day. Take care. Up the Clarence. <laughs>